Good evening and welcome from Kenya. My name is Wangare. I am the lead mentor at Ada Africa Journal Club. The Ada Africa Journal Club is a program that seeks to empower early career scholars all the way up to scholars um, on the verge of retirement in research skills. We develop research leaders. And today we are gathered here for a really interesting topic on qualitative data analysis. But before I introduce our guest speaker, who I see is already on the Zoom, I would also like to invite all of us joining, especially our guests, to please introduce yourselves in the chat. I see that a lot of people have already done so. Thank you so much. We have Emmanuel Chikalipa who says, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, good evening. <laughs> Ahmed Abdi, MSc Animal Production and Marketing. My field, this is research is zoonotic disease and their impact on marketing livestock from Gulu University, Uganda. Welcome Ahmed. Demba Balde from Gambia, a PhD student from the University of the Gambia. Happy to join this webinar. We have Emmanuel Chikalipa, MSc Plant Breeding and Seed System from the University of Zambia. Research interest, genetic analysis of cowpea in phosphorus limiting soils. Wow. And Ahmed adds that his expectation will be positive to get full understanding of data analyzing and knowledge. Wonderful. Thanks, Ahmed, for adding that. Isaiah Meli from uh, Kisi University, Kenya, is studying a PhD in education. He says, good evening. And then we have Jeremy Nganda, who is from Daystar University in Kenya. His research interests are development communication, health communication. And uh, Demba Balde from the Gambia, a PhD student from the University of the Gambia, specialized in climate change education. Uh, interests uh, is climate change induced irregular migration of Gambia's youth. Happy to join this webinar. Supreme Maloba says, good evening, everyone. Mildred Ojiambo from Kenya, research interests, women and paid labor. I look forward to learning how to use qualitative data. We have Adewoyin Oluyinka Benedicta from Department of Crop Science and Horticulture, Federal University Oye Ekiti, Nigeria. Welcome, Adewoyin. Then we have David Murwaru, research in politics and social issues. Looking forward to the event. Saada Kimuli, Makerere University Business School, Uganda, special in entrepreneurship, sustainability, and entrepreneurial marketing. Doris Njoka from Department of Educational Technology, Kenyatta University, Kenya. Judith Bira, lecturer, educational psychology from Chambogo University. Thank you so much for introducing yourselves. Please keep the chats coming. If you haven't told us your name, institution, research interest, and what is your expectation, especially for today, uh, please do so. And now, uh, just before I hand over to our uh, speaker, who is actually one of us, I would like to introduce her. And we are very honored today to have Paris Musitia, who actually uh, is doing an amazing work uh, already in the club, uh, very actively answering our, our fellow researchers' questions. And I'll tell you a little bit about her background. So Paris Musitia, has a Bachelor of Science in Disaster Management and International Diplomacy from Masinde Muliro University of Technology, MUST, Science and Technology, that's MUST in Kenya. She also matriculated with her Master of Arts in Development Studies at Catholic University of Eastern Africa. And here this, she's doing her second master's. Master of Arts in Sociology at the same university, Catholic University of Eastern Africa, Kuea. She is an aspiring PhD candidate. She also says she has eight years experience in health systems and policy research and has so far authored three publications in health related journals, among others. So at this juncture, I would like to invite our speaker, Paris, I'd like to hand it over to you. You're welcome. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Wangari. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for creating time to come to listen to this, uh, today's presentation. And uh, I'd like to adopt uh, a two-way learning, not, not me presenting, but I, I'm looking forward for a, an engagement between uh, us because aren't, uh, all of us are uh, researchers uh, from the bios uh, in the inbox, in the chat. I can see we are a resource and I would like to see that engagement. Wonderful. And would you like to also switch on your video or do you want to have it off? Uh, I'll have it off because I have uh, <laughs> okay. more people coming in and out. You'll excuse me. All right, that's fine. You may proceed. Yes. Yeah, so for today's presentation, I'm going to take you through uh, the research, introduction to research, and uh, particularly qualitative research, the comparison for qualitative and quantitative research. Uh, this, the sampling, how we do sampling in qualitative research, uh, and also how we, we the methods for the data collection approaches that we adopt in qualitative research, and the qualitative data analysis and uh, writing approaches. So before we start, I have a very simple brainstorming story that I want us to read, and uh, using the chat box, I would like us to to type our responses. So I'll read, uh, Juma has fallen in love with Rehema and wants to marry her. Rehema informs her father who agrees to the proposal, but needs to find out more details about the family of Juma. They later learn that uh, Zara, aunt to Juma, is a neighbor to where Rehema's sister is married. So my question is, uh, what do you think Rehema and her family need to do to learn more about Juma and his family? Uh, and uh, these are um, Islam set up uh, uh, family and uh, the proposals, uh, once the proposals have been made, they, there's something need to be done for them to know whether the Rehema can be married off to Juma or not. So what do you think can be done? And uh, what approaches do you think Rehema's family might need to use uh, to get details about Juma before deciding to approve their marriage? Uh, two minutes. Hungary, you'll help me to read the chat. Sure, sure. Let's see um, who will begin. I think people are still digesting the story. Uh, Conrad Ojiambo is so funny. He says a spy should be sent to the village. Anyone else with contrary views to Conrad or who supports Conrad's opinion? What approaches will Rehema's family need to get details about Juma in order to approve the marriage? <laughs> Conrad adds, the spy should find out information on whether they are related. So for those coming in, please read the story on the screen and tell us what approaches Rehema's family need to employ. We are now living in an age where we need to understand the family before we enter marriage. So how should they go about getting information? Remember, we are all qualitative researchers today. Jeremy Anganda says, talk to the aunt to give info about Juma and the family. Judith Bira says, engage Zara Juma's aunt for more background information. Ahmed Abi says, I think Zara's aunt would be the point starter so we can go to her and get full information. Jeremy Anganda, Rehema's aunt should do interviews in quotes. <laughs> I don't know why it's in quotes. Peter Mokaya says, Rehema's sister should get more information about Juma through his aunt Zara. Mwanzana Masi says, through Rehema's sister to find out more from Zara to get info. Mildred Ojiambo says, use the ant to identify the family, friends and colleagues who know Juma and his family, then talk to them. Josephine Opondo says, the ant can give information required. <laughs> so I think we are all agreeing with uh, Conrad's view 
and nobody has said anything uh, contrary except talk to the ant, you know. So anyone with any different opinion? It seems we are all saying the same thing so far, Paris. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Hilary Coros yeah. also says the same. Use Rehema to find enough information about Juma. Wow, mm -hmm. wow. Well, quite interesting. Okay. So we are finding information. So the key here is uh, the key word that we are all agreeing is we need to find information. But uh, I didn't get clearly how we are finding the information. So those are the approaches I was looking for. Yes, you are right. So we, Most people talked about this process, but not how. So they're saying talk to Juma's aunt via Rehema's sister. That's Doris Njoka. Yeah, so Demba Balde, the same. Rehema's aunt can supply all the family needs to know about the potential sweeter. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. So um, when we talk about qualitative, when we talk about uh, qualitative, is that we are trying to, uh, to find information. So I'm just using this particular story to like an icebreaker to help us to think outside the box. And uh, clearly I see everybody's only focusing on Zara. Zara is only a lead, right? Because he's the aunt and he's married to, is a marriage to, uh, to next to Rehema's sister. But remember we have other, other options, we have the village elders, uh, we have the, we have the family, we have the neighbors, we have not included them here. So basically what we are doing, we are gathering information. And why do we gather the information? Why gathering information about uh, Juma? Why are we doing all that? To help us in making a decision whether to marry off Rehema according to our culture or not. So you have to look for evidence. You have to look for uh, concrete evidence using different methods to arrive at a decision that uh, you are contented with. And this is our, what we call research, yeah, gathering of information, not just information, systematic, relevant, uh, gathering information in a systematic way. For example, everybody, two or three people have mentioned, Zara is a lead. So you're going to use Zara to lead you to the family of Juma. And someone mentioned about interview, you're going to interview Zara and uh, that's not uh, comprehensive. That's just one aspect. So we, we gather information systematically. And uh, for this particular kind of information is more qualitative. You're not going to ask Zara, uh, do you know Juma? And then she says yes. So what about it? So what kind of information and how do we get this information is what we want to talk about today. Uh, just before. I just want to pose a question uh, from this story. Is it relating to, does it relate to research? What we do as acad academia in our field, does this, uh, does this uh, example relate to our work? You can use the chat box. We still have more interesting responses about the story. And now the question is on its applicability, but actually Charlie Kalinzi, Charles Kalinzi says, if Zara st st stated in Western world for long, her behavior, character, and lifestyle might have changed as compared to Juma, although family information is still the same. Conrad said, it, it doesn't sound very academic, but yes, we do make inquiries in academic research. <laughs> Ahmed Abi says, yes, since we are looking for info, it's study. Okay, so there we have a contrary view. Conrad says, not too academic. Ahmed says, yes, it is a, a, a study proper. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, uh, and that's why when we start talking about qualitative and people think uh, we make stories and people think, uh, this thing is that uh, we are making too much stories and the vision, this is what is all about qualitative. So let me just put the next slide. Okay. So in qualitative research, we, 
we aim to develop concepts which help us to understand the social phenomena in natural rather than experimental settings. And uh, we emphasize more on the meanings, experiences, and views of the participants according to Pope and Mays in 1995. And this from that particular example, we, we, when you say you're going to talk to Zara, 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 Zara to share her experience in regard to Juma as, um, as, a, as his nephew, so you're looking for what does she have to say about this particular person and particular family? So you're looking for the views, the experiences of these people and the meanings. So, uh, we attach more, we, we focus more in in-depth uh, meanings rather than just uh, getting those uh, automatic yes or no responses. And also qualitative research aims to study things in their natural settings. We attempt to make sense of uh, uh, or interpret uh, the phenomena in terms of the meanings people bring to them. So most uh, of the response, for example, if Sarah says, uh, Juma is a good, is a very good, a good boy. He has, uh, he has good behaviors. So that statement, how we interpret it will depend on a lot of factors. How good is good? And how do you define good in this context? And now that is how we bring in qualitative to enable us to explore in depth uh, certain and assign meanings to what, uh, what, what is said. It, our qualitative research also helps us to understand human experiences uh, and meanings within a given context. Rather than using numbers, we, use, uh, we interpret the experiences and generate understandings to recognize the role of the researcher in construction of the knowledge. So we, we as researchers, we usually say qualitative is a bit biased because there is a, the issue of subjectivity and um, positionality when it comes to interpretation. So we interpret what has been said up, uh, and based on the experiences of the person who has said, how it has said, when and, and, um, and, and, and the voice, uh, what can I say, the nonverbal cues, how it was said. So qualitative research uses a naturalistic approach that, that aims to seek, uh, to understand the phenomena in the context specific setting, such as the real world setting. And that's why one person has said that this is not more of academic, it looks uh, non-academic, but yes, that is qualitative. We, 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 we take ourselves deeper into the real, uh, real world setting. Qualitative research methods involve the use of uh, qualitative data. I'm sorry for that, uh, small people. <laughs> qualitative research uh, method involves the use of uh, qualitative data. Uh, we use interviews, documents, observations, in order to understand and, and explain this social phenomena. So for example, the example I just started sharing, so what approaches could have been used uh, to obtain information about Juma's family? First, uh, Rema's family can send a representative to go to their family, to Juma's uh, location, and just do observation. Just look at their household. Just look at the neighborhood. Which kind of neighborhood does this Juma come from? Even without asking a question, just by observing, you're able to obtain some information. Uh, other option would be uh, interviewing. They said you can interview Zara, who is the aunt. You can talk to Zara and um, ask in depth questions about this particular Juma. Another option you will you'll try to talk to the other village elders. And why do we, do we have to use different sources uh, to obtain information on the same thing? We are doing this because we want to triangulate. Yes, I can observe, uh, I can observe the household. And I say, no, I, I think I need to get more information. Why, why are you having very many houses during that homestead? Then I, I might talk to the neighbor. I might do an interview with the neighbor to ask a few questions to back up what I've observed. Or I might decide to do, um, to read documents. If that family has a written, written documents about them, then I might decide to read more. So I, can, I might decide to use the interview, to interview the aunt, the neighbors, use documents. I might decide just to do observation, to observe even um, Juma in his own natural environment. I just uh, hanging around, 
and seeing him operating with his fellow boys uh, and how he hangs around. Yeah, so I'll be collecting information about this particular uh, person that will help me to make my decision regarding this particular marriage. Uh, qualitative research also, uh, they, they have their origin, we have uh, the origin of qualitative research in social sciences. That it enables the researchers to study social and cultural oriented phenomena. Uh, in today's world, uh, qualitative methods and analysis are, have been extended to almost every research field and area. Uh, for example, uh, we have um, the ECP, International uh, Science Insect. We have ILRI guys who are in pure sciences. They are trying to uh, inculcate social science and qualitative method to explain the scientific. Uh, evidences that they have. So I'll give an example. Uh, when you say, uh, you say this person has TB and uh, you do all the tests and the TB, yes, you find the, the TB is there, yes, but you can understand the pre-exposing factors uh, of this person. Then you bring in the social, social aspect, social science, to understand the home environment where the person is coming from and how the home environment might have contributed to this person testing positive for TB. So it's going beyond just the scientific and the pure science. We are now adopting protective methods to, uh, to back up uh, these particular scientific evidences and give a, a social explanation to some of these findings. So when we, we say we're going to do interviews, we're going to do um, documentaries, you're going to ask questions. Which kind of questions are these do we really look forward to in qualitative? So we have different types of questions. Uh, first, we have the hypothetical. These are questions that uh, they give you a chance to, to explain something. It's more like a hypothesis. For example, if you get the chance to be an HIV scientist, do you think you can discover that vaccine? So that is a very hypothetical question to pose maybe to a person who is a scientist and they can give their views. Some questions are pro provocative, they provoke the respondent. For example, I can say I've heard people say most evaluations are subjective, what do you think? So you're just provo are provoking this person to mention their school of thought in regard to, to your question. We have other questions which are ideal, we call them ideal questions. For example, these are very the common questions that we use. Eh? Uh, in your opinion, what would be the best solution for eliminating gender-based violence? In your opinion, what do you think are the impact of COVID-19 on teenage pregnancies in Kenya? So those are ideal questions huh, that you can use. Also, you can explore the use of um, interpretive questions, questions that you, 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 you tend to interpret. And this is mostly more of a follow-up question. And uh, as I said earlier, when Zara's, uh, when Juma's aunt Zara says, uh, Juma is a good boy, I've seen him grow. He has been a very good boy in all his um, childhood and even now as a, as a young man. So what does, uh, what do you mean by good? So you, you are seeking interpretation of the participant by what they mean when they say it's good. Or once on, uh, you, you're looking for the impact of COVID-19 on teenage, teenage pregnancy and the, the, someone says, uh, I think this COVID-19 has had a very uh, a very big effect. So what, what is big? What is, what is this thing that you are referring to? So you allow the participant to interpret uh, that particular response. It's usually more of a follow-up question or it can be an independent question. For example, if someone says, uh, um, um, teenage pregnancy has been caused by the lack of uh, schools being closed. So you say, tell me more about it. So what do you mean about schools being closed? How did it contribute? So you're seeking for interpretation. Some questions you also can use leading questions. Uh, for example, do you think prevention is better than cure? Yeah, that's a very straight uh, leading question that you can pose to a participant. Some questions that you can also use, they are very loading. We call them loading questions. Uh, for example, as when you ask a child, uh, you can ask a, you ask a child, uh, uh, what do you understand by uh, sexual intercourse? A child who is 12 years. Or what do you, what do you understand by condom use? Have you, have you seen condom adverts on the television? What do you understand by the condom? So that particular question is a bit loading. It's a bit heavy, I'll say so, for, and a response that might that you might require at that particular time. But 
However, loading questions can be posed if uh, you have created a rapport with this particular participant and the participant is confident and comfortable with you so that they can open up. Otherwise, some of these loading questions, you might get a response of pass. Uh, I'm not going to respond to that one right now. Let's, let's do it later. So you have to be very tactical in, in uh, how you post your questions to get the right responses. Some questions, we call them multiple questions. Uh, for example, tell me your favorite authors, uh, the book you like best, and by which author, and why do you think you like this book? So th those are multiple questions. And so out of this, you can, you can clearly see that the questions which we can, uh, they are easy to respond to. Others might uh, not have a direct response, but now might need you to prop and do a follow-up in depth for you to understand, uh, it, understand what the participant really aims to. So when you're designing your qualitative research tool or your qualitative research interviews, you might consider uh, those different kinds of questions. But we, we usually say always um, to avoid leading questions, which lead the participant to either say yes or no. Uh, the qualitative questions also, they are um, based on our experience. Uh, we, you can also ask uh, based on the experience of the participant. For example, when you tell your manager that the project has failed, what happens? So you, lo you are looking at uh, personal experiences. Uh, when, uh, when, for example, if it's a teenage, a teenage girl, you are, being, you are interviewing her about teenage pregnancy, you can ask her, when you discovered um, you are pregnant, uh, what happened? What do you do? Yeah, so you're looking for personal experiences or it can also be group experiences. Yeah, so when you are, you are table banking group realized about the defaulting of members, what happened? Yeah, so the, the responses can be a group or individual, based on the, when you're interested in looking at the experiences of the person you are interviewing. Also, when you're looking at opinion, opinion of the opinion of the person, and this usually applies to key, key, um, key stakeholders. For example, when, you're, when interviewing the village elders, the key administrators, the key people you seek for their opinion. For example, if you're interviewing a study and you're interviewing nurses, you'll, you'll be interested to talk to the nurse leaders or the hospital administrators, share their opinion uh, because they, they stand in a position of opinion. So what do you think about the role of evaluation for program improvement? So what is your opinion on a program improvement? So that's what you're asking. Another question, another focus of qualitative questions, we focus these questions on feelings. So uh, how does the participant feel? For example, when you got to know that the project was a success, how did you feel? How did it make you feel? Yeah, so you allow the participant to express, to express their feelings. Also, we, we focus on the knowledge. Tell me more about different ways of promoting PME. So if you are interested in the, knowledge also, you'll also ask these particular questions, but these questions also are specifically targeted to specific kind of respondents. We shall come to learn, I'm going to talk you through respondents uh, in the next, as we proceed. Also in terms of input, when you have lectures on evaluability assessment, what does the instructor tell you? So this in terms of the input, how, what has been, what, what, go, what, uh, what has gone on. For example, if it's a project, uh, what has been done? How has been the assessment? So some of the questions might be focusing on those particular aspects. So in qualitative, we also have uh, common uh, methodologies or designs that we usually adopt. Uh, you can say your study is going to use a case study design or are going to use a grounded theory. Yeah, or a narrative. So what are these study designs? They, they help you to, they guide you on uh, what kind of uh, design you're going to use for your particular research. And this is also more uh, guided by your research questions and what you want to achieve at the end of your research. So we have the first study design, uh, the grounded theory. Uh, for the grounded theory, it aims to, generate, it aims to explain a social process or an action or an interaction. And it's usually constructed from the data of participants who have experienced the phenomena under the study. So in, in grounded theory, you, 
you, you, you, you form the theory as you proceed from the data collection to the data analysis. So for, if uh, you're doing grounded theory uh, design, when you, you, you start your data collection, um, you come back in the evening and you brainstorm as a research team and you look for questions, whether they're answering your, 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 your objectives or not, you can keep on adding questions as well as removing questions as the theory uh, uh, generates. And this goes to analysis. You'll, you, you'll start from general and narrow down as the, as the data evolves. We also have a case study design. It is a, it is a, for this design, it aims to understand um, a distinctive case defined as a specific complex functioning thing. It can be a person, it can be a, a specific area, a classroom or an institution. For example, if you, are, you want to do a qualitative study on, on, on oncology nurses, uh, the uh, experiences of on oncology nurses on offering emotional support for the on oncology patients. So this particular uh, case study will be for on oncology nurses. So you are you have you have streamlined and you have uh, you are only view, doing a specific group who are the on oncology nurses. So that is your case study. Another study design is a phenomenology. Uh, for this phenomenology, it tries to understand the unique lived experiences of individuals by exploring the meaning of a phenomena. So from this uh, phenomenology, data uh, uh, descriptive data is further interpreted and analyzed to enable the researcher to uncover a description of the essence of that particular phenomena. Another common study design that we usually adopt is also the ethnography. And uh, you, I'm sure some of you have had ethnographic studies. Uh, for ethnography, the, the focus is, uh, is to examine the, the patterns of sh uh, the shared behaviors, beliefs, and languages within a cultural group. And this requires um, very extended timelines of observation by the researcher. So the key method for ethnography is a more of observation and it should be have a specific uh, time, sometimes a uh, specific time limit. It's not the time extended. It takes a lot of time for you to observe these participants in the natural environment and document. So the researcher does uh, will describe and interpret the meaning of behaviors, the languages, the interactions among this particular group that you are observing. Narratives. Um, this is also a study design and, and it's focused on the detailed stories or life experiences of a single event for a small number of individuals. So we call them nar nar narrative uh, study designs or narrative research. Uh, for this kind of narrative, uh, you, people share their stories um, and uh, it can be for a, a very lengthy period of time. The same people sharing the same stories uh, at different intervals, at different uh, times of their lives. And then uh, the last one, we have the action research and participatory, uh, participatory research where we have the individuals and groups researching in their own personal things, uh, in their social, cultural settings and experiences. So how do we do sampling in qualitative research? So the aim, first the aim of, for us to sample, unlike in quantitative, we don't have a uh, uh, predetermined uh, sampling uh, methods or procedures or uh, I say uh, we don't have a predetermined sample size or sample size determination the way that is done in quantitative. Mostly sampling is done in uh, purposively and, and sampling uh, is done based on, on a research topic, on the kind of um, participants you need. So if you are doing the uh, um, experience of on oncology nurses in supporting, in offering emotional support for of, uh, on oncology patients, then it means your participants already are purposively nurses who are offering on oncology care and patients who are um, suffering, who are in the oncology department. So you, you are guided by your research, by your research itself, and also you are guided by your uh, objective which you want to achieve. So you already have a purposive, um, you already have a predetermined uh, kind of uh, sample that you, you want to work with. 
so the size of the sample uh, also we do, is determined by the richness of the kind of data that you want to collect. So we we we, we peg uh, uh, sample size on the on the saturation point. Yes, we have an we might we might say you want to interview twenty nurses working in um, you know in uh, this specific hospital, which is a referral hospital. Yes, but uh, by the time we're doing our 18th interview or 15th interview, there's no new information coming out. Then I think we, have, uh, we might stop based on the saturation. So until, what, what I said about saturation is uh, collecting data until you get, uh, until no new information is being generated from the data. So you don't have to keep on repeating again because it's qualitative. You are interested in the in-depth and the value of the information rather than the numbers. Of the information. And this explains why you might find a study that has done only 20 interviews or even 10 interviews. We are interested in the richness of the data and the in depth rather than the numbers. So we have the purposive theoretical uh, sampling, uh, which is selected according to the relevance, to, uh, relevance of the study. Or we, do, or we can use convenience sampling. For example, if you are doing, um, you are doing, uh, Adolescent pregnancy study. You want to understand uh, the impact of COVID-19 on adolescents uh, in a specific area. So you don't know how how many adolescents got pregnant, or you don't know who got pregnant in that particular village. So you might get one one or two uh, participants who will lead you to their other um, or who will nominate their friends or their but there are other colleagues who are also meeting your criteria for enrollment into the study. So potentially they are going to refer you or to the participants uh, to come for your study. So you, you will have a passive sampling, then you also now do the convenience snowballing. So once you have identified your, method, your, your uh, sampling methodology, and then uh, you, you need, need to have your tools ready. So what kind of data collection tools are you going to use or methods? We're going to use interviews. Well, mostly we use interviews in qualitative research. And these interviews can be either structured, semi-structured or unstructured. Structured is where you're having across questions and uh, you're, guided by the, you're guided by the questionnaire. A semi-structured involves a few predetermined areas of interest, with possible prompts to help in guiding the conversation. And then the last is the unstructured interviews. Uh, it involves a broad area to explore the researchers largely. And also in these uh, unstructured interviews, the researcher largely follows the direction of the participant. So you have questions, we call them interview guide. They're just guiding you. They're open and uh, you are more of guided by the participant responses than your structured uh, question. So we keep it open and uh, to make sure the participant uh, is uh, sticks to the objective. So it is the work or the role of the research assistant or you are a researcher to, want to make sure your, your interviewee or the person you're interviewing is within uh, the questions. For example, if you're looking at uh, pregnancy and uh, someone starts talking about, uh, I don't know, maybe about cultural heritage, things that are not related then, have to control that participant to come back to these uh, relevant uh, questions. So yes, you are guided by the by the participants. The response they give you will lead to the next question. But then again, you have to ensure that you are within the objectives that you want to achieve. They are usually, the interviews are usually done face to face or we can do via telephone. And especially during COVID, most organizations or most researchers have shifted to do phone interviews or, or via internet like Zoom. So individual interviews are very helpful, especially when you, as a, when you as a researcher, you want to explore the experience or experiences or views of individuals. And um, interviews, are, we have the individual interview, then you have the, the key informant interviews. Key informant interviews, these are interviews for, if you're interviewing the uh, informant people, the key people. Uh, for example, if you are talking about the adolescent pregnancy, you want, to talk, you want to talk to the counselors as the key informant, you want to talk to the village administrators as the key informant, you want to talk to the uh, Minister of Education, you want to talk to people who offer services, these adolescents. Yeah, so you, those are some of the people that you will bring in as your key informant, who will have opinion, who will um, share from the, uh, the, from the knowledge point of view. 
another method is focus group discussion. And uh, for the focus group, it brings together participants uh, between a number of six to 12 individuals, but uh, we say six, is, six to eight is a good number, also to avoid crowding. And these are also, you can use the same approach, either because the interview guide can be structured, then be structured or unstructured, depending on your research question. So the focus group discussions, they can be homogeneous group or heterogeneous groups. This means uh, you can have an FGD with a um, group of people who have a similar experiences, while another one that people don't have a similar uh, experience. For example, you might have uh, women who are all pregnant, you know, an FGD you might decide to mix with women who are pregnant and those, those who are not pregnant to get diverse views. Uh, but you, you are asking the same question, but you can have one a group that has, you can decide to have only pregnant women as a group or decide to have all women, whether pregnant or not pregnant in one group to get dynamic views. And also as a researcher, I need extra skills to be able to control a focus group because the downside is uh, how people will dominate the discussion. And if you're not skillful, you might end up having three or four people uh, talking so much in the group and others are not talking. So you need to have the skills to, to, to and make sure you're engaging everyone and uh, those who are talking so much, you're also able to accommodate them so they don't feel like uh, you're neglecting them also. And uh, it's, it's important to do an focus group discussion when, when you are looking for, you want to gain a range of views about a particular issue in one setup. Uh, the, this is observation. Uh, observation can be the formal, uh, the, Participant observation or non-participant observation. Participant observation is where you, you, you can indulge yourself uh, in, um, in a setup and uh, observe, observe the participants in their natural environment uh, with their knowledge. When a non-participant is where you can do it without uh, their knowledge. Yeah, but, but uh, observation also as a method has a weakness. Um, because when a, a participant knows is being observed, then they might pretend. So observation becomes time consuming because you might need to do this uh, over a long period of time so that you're able to, to deal with that biasness. So you might decide, for example, if you're doing to, to observe our oncology nurses, how they are supporting their oncology patients in a hospital, then you might want to, to observe them in the morning, how nurses behave in the morning, how they behave in the afternoon, how they behave at night, how they behave uh, during weekend, during holiday, how they behave on a weekday, how they behave on a on a, a busy day, on a, a, a lighter day. So you, you might have to look for different scenarios over a period of long time for people to for you to get the observations, uh, the right observations. And during observation, you, you use uh, you can use an observation guide. It can be either structured or unstructured. Uh, the, have, the last one we have document analysis. This refers to written documents that may check uh, any form of a textbook, articles, or a minutes of a meeting. So if you're having training, sometimes we do, but we do uh, minutes of meetings, minutes of trainings. So these minutes can also be part of uh, analysis. And um, we also have uh, photographs, drawings, uh, even tele television programs can also be captured under document analysis. Most of the time we use, uh, we, we encourage uh, the use of uh, these methods, all of these methods together to triangulate the findings. So you might have, you, you might choose to use an interview, uh, do an FGD, and also do observation, triangulate your findings. Because, because what you might observe, you might decide to do an interview to do a follow-up on what you observed uh, and ask questions like, I was here uh, and you, you mentioned you when I was there, I observed that nurses kept a distance. What can you talk about this? So it gives an opportunity to, to use uh, different methods uh, to arrive uh, and, and, um, and get an answer to your question. We have other, other data collection methods uh, that I've not mentioned, uh, which I've just said others because uh, they are not usually used in most of the time. So we have the think aloud model. I call it think aloud model. Uh, this captures uh, thinking in specific situations. And this method of data collection applies mostly in, uh, I say, an IT, in the IT environment. Those guys are in IT environment or scientific, after scientific practical environment. So for example, if you are launching an application and you want to see 
how the application is uh, is running and then you will you you keep you will give me i'll give you an application then i tell you open the app as you open you encourage the participant to think aloud like okay hi this app how does it look like i don't like the interface and it's happening very slowly does it a lot of space on my phone so it, uh, it the think aloud model allows uh, the person to capture the, the other person's mind and you can you can uh, have um, an, a, a guide as you allow the participant to think aloud you can record those um, conversations and use them uh, for for your research and to do a report uh, so there is offers, uh, i am really liking the presentation and I see we are 15 minutes to the top of the hour. So we will be taking questions at the end or at, at this point. Can we have them at the end of your presentation or what do you think? Let's have yes. at the end. Uh, at the that. end. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so we have the Think Aloud model. Then we have the Vignettes. Uh, Vignettes are just, um, you can have a sample, uh, uh, a story and then you ask questions and then people respond. This is an example of a big net. A uh, patient does this. What will you do? So you give a scenario, then you ask her questions. That's also a method of collecting qualitative data. So I'll go to the data analysis. Uh, in qualitative data, a data is not in numbers, as you've seen, it's more of into words, opinions, values, uh, behaviors of people. So our data is usually, uh, when you're doing interviews, you record your data, and uh, this data is uh, the, is then, uh, transcribed into transcript. So we, we, we can have uh, the quality of data, types of data, we can have the structure, uh, that is the stories, the surveys, we can have the structure, the transcription, where you transcribe the whole audio a verbatim, how it was said without changing meaning. Uh, also the audio recordings that you recorded can also be analyzed on their own as a data and video recordings. So how do you prepare a transcript? You just transcribe the, trans, the, the audio into a word document, word by word, verbatim without changing anything. Considering nonverbal expression, make sure you, that you, you retain them so that you understand the, the flow of the conversation. Then also you need to try to do at least one transcript yourself to understand the flow of the conversation. So uh, your transcript will have a project, uh, a research title, that we call it the metadata, uh, the research title, the, data of the data collection, uh, the ID. You remember in qualitative, we de-identify our participants. We don't list their names. So we'll have an ID. You can gen generate your ID uh, by yourself. This is an example of, a, of um, a metadata. So I have the name of the interview, the type of interview is an FGD, participant type is men, place of interview, time, duration. Why, why are we interested about the duration of the interview? You, uh, productivity should, uh, between an interview should be between 45 to 60 minutes. So we, we should try to make it a bit uh, productive within those particular hours. So how do you analyze qualitative data? Uh, we, we try to identify uh, this, how, we, how we interpret the world, why they have that point of view, what, what, why the person said, why they have that point of view of what they said, how they came to that view, what they have been doing and how they conveyed their view of their situation. Look at the tonation, look at the context, you read the, what, how it was said, you know, how even the, the, the voice of the participant, how, it, how he raised the, the point also brings in our interpretation. So qualitative data analysis usually involves two things. Uh, we have writing and the identification of themes. So uh, I'll just give a definition of what are the themes uh, as we proceed. Uh. So when you are analyzing your qualitative data, the text itself, we look for the primary message, the content of the message, the attitude of the speaker as uh, what the, the message, the content of the message, uh, is it individual or a group shared idea? So if someone says, I think uh, in this community, a uh, girl's, uh, because of not going to school, some of them have gotten pregnant. So are you talking from an individual point of view or a group shared idea? So you, you, you also for, uh, have to keep in mind that when you are interpreting your data. The, the degree to which the speaker is uh, representing the actual service hypothetical experiences. Some experiences might be uh, 
actual, others might be very hypothetical. So you need to put that in mind as you 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 analyze or as you interpret your data. So yeah, Paris, I just wanted to say this is the gist of the presentation. This is course, so take your time. We can go a little over the hour, no problem. So uh, this is wonderful. So so that you don't feel rushed. <laughs> we'll add more time. Um, our audience is always very patient. So this is very good. Please proceed. Yeah, so we have tools that we use to uh, help in analyzing the uh, in an analytical process. We have the summaries. Huh? Uh, a summary should contain the key points that emerge uh, from undertaking a specific activity. So if you're if you are doing interview on uh, uh, pregnancy in adolescence uh, during COVID-19, then at the end of every interview, you do an interview summary, call it an interview summary. This summary should help you, should be like a pre-analysis of the analysis. So you write down the main themes that came out, what did they speak that stood out, and what do you think you're going to follow up? So those are summaries. You have self-memos. They also allow you to make a recording of the ideas which occurred to you in your research. There are things that might not be in the audio when you, trans when you transcribe, so you note them down. Uh, and also we have the research diary. As a researcher in qualitative, you have to keep your diary, you have to write your, your observations in the field. You know, when you have done your interviews, you sit down and write uh, your notes. So all that is data that can be used for analysis. So this is just a sample, a debrief or a summary note. Uh, for example, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's a request from Ahmed uh, to slow down. This is very good. He's saying, oh, maybe you can give us some examples. Um, he says, I got lost somewhere. <laughs> maybe Ahmed, you can say exactly where you got lost, but um, this is really the, the gist. This is really good. So maybe give us some examples to uh, drive the point home. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Ahmed. Do I do you get lost? I can just get back, please. Ahmed, you can unmute your audio. Um, please, uh, please go welcome. back to uh, to uh, when you are talking about the, the the next slide. Please go go back. Yeah. Yes. 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 Here. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, when you're analyzing your data, it involves two things. Uh, there's writing and the identification of themes. Huh? Themes are like, are, um, uh, let me say, uh, they're like sub, sub top. Uh, when you have an interview guide, uh, you, you have, um, I, I'll give an example of uh, teenage pregnancies uh, when you're doing a social teenage pregnancy. What are the causes of teenage pregnancies? Uh, how can we deal with teenage pregnancies uh, as a country? And what can we, uh, what can we do to help these girls? So causes of teenage pregnancy is a theme on its own. So you, you, you'll have to write and identify those particular themes as per your data, as the data is, is uh, responding to you. So you read your data and you try to write those themes down. So finding these themes is part of the overwhelming majority of the qualitative data. So once you have identified your themes, it becomes now uh, like a, a working document for you to keep on updating uh, it as you keep on reading more transcripts. And I'll, I'll, I'll also repeat this. So the primary message when you're analyzing your, in those particular themes, you look at the content. Uh, how was it, what was said, and what was the attitude of the speaker when they were saying these particular words? And um, was this, uh, say, was this uh, statement individual or a group shared idea? Then is it an actual or a hypothetical experience? Because if someone says, I think most of the girls here, uh, they are raped, they, 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 or they just have bad manners. So is that actual or hypothetical? So you as an interpreter, as a qualitative researcher, when you're analyzing, you need to give an extra thought to those particular statements and give it meaning to what uh, is being said. And I say, these are some of the tools that you might need when you in the field as a researcher, you'll do your summaries, you'll do your self memos and also a research diary, always to write your observations. At the end of the day, when you have collected your data or you or, or your research assistants, you have to sit down and do a debrief. A debrief is just a summary note of uh, what is the interesting thing that came out in the field, what surprised you most? Uh, do you think there's anything that can be done to improve? So debrief helps you to see whether you are achieving your objectives or not. You remember in qualitative, you have the opportunity to 
change questions, add or remove questions as you proceed. So you're not going to be streamlined. So during these debriefs, you share your you share your ideas as a team, and you see what you can uh, work on to update your interview guide or to improve in terms of. Uh, you can say even like that. Res the respondent that I talked to did not have knowledge on this particular topic. So are you going to replace that participant, or are you going to just found that participant? So those are the things you you brainstorm through in, during our debrief meetings. Yeah. So uh, these are the terms we use in qualitative data. We have themes. Themes are the ideas that categories that emerge from grouping of lower level data points. The, the, I, I'll give an, just a simple one, which I say it's like a subtopic, the subtopics that are emerging in your data. You have a code. A code is um, once you have a um, process of direct pregnancy, that's an, a, a theme. Then under that, you are going to code data that are talking about uh, uh, what is causing such pregnancy, about uh, the schools being closed, COVID-19 uh, measures. So all those you you highlight and you 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 group them. Now we call them the codes. The process of doing that is the process of uh, grouping that particular responses into specific uh, subtitles. Is what we call the coding process. It's just unfortunate that I can't share the software because it needs a lot of installation and some of them are need to be bought. So I'll just explain that theoretically. Then we have the coding sort. Uh, we, we are able to compile uh, similar coded blocks of text from different sources into a single file or report. So you are having ten transcripts about teenage pregnancies. So you are looking at in every transcript what did they say as a process of teenage pregnancy. So you you ma you 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 combine all these responses that particular question into the coding sort. Then we can do indexing. Uh, you, you can generate a list uh, comprising of all the words that were used uh, within that particular text. For example, you can decide to look for the word uh, COVID-19. So you index how many times was COVID-19 as a word used in that particular text. This is the software can help you, or you can do it manually. So qualitative analysis of itself, it's a, it is a circular and a a non-linear process. So it doesn't have a straight way forward. You, you go around the data, the data informs you, you are guided by the data rather than your own objective. And it's, it's iterative and progressive. It involves a close interaction with the data. You have to involve yourself in the data by starting from reading the transcript or listening to the audios, reading the transcript. You can read and reread even three times as you try to generate those particular subtopics as they emerge. Data collection happens at the same time in data analysis, it's simultaneous. Remember, during the debriefs, you're already doing a pre-analysis of your data. And then the level of analysis varies. Uh, we have level one, level two, level three, depending on how much you want to go and what you want to get from your data. I think there is some people are very curious to see these softwares, and two people have asked, Vincent Okoz and Charlie Kalinzi. Can you share screen and demonstrate using software? I think Paris already mentioned that that will be complicated today, but these are softwares that you could install and maybe that's a different uh, webinar. That's a different training session on that. We've had uh, in the past, you know, uh, sessions where we actually explore the softwares for qualitative uh, work. So I don't think that's uh, uh, a possibility today. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Vincent says thanks. He has understood that. So please bear with us. But um, if you get the theory of it, then you can do it because at the end of the day, uh, you, the human being, will be working with the software. So you need to know what you'll be doing, anyways. So, Paris, I think that's um, a comprehensive answer. Or do you want to add about the softwares or where people can get them? Uh, Charlie was saying, no, I meant the PDF document. <laughs> Uh, you know so anyway i think uh with the links you've sent we can download ourselves isn't it yes 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 i'm going to okay. share the links yeah okay wonderful oh, okay. let me just take you through the last part these are uh, the analysis are just like in, quanti in quantitative we also have analysis met methods of analysis that we use in qualitative we have the thematic analysis we have the content analysis uh, we have discourse analysis, critical discourse analysis, and we have the narrative analysis. So also, in your analysis, you might want to choose uh, what kind of analysis approach you want to use. 
uh, thematic analysis uh, is this is a common and mostly approachable method for beginners and for most people in quality testing because it allows you to generate data based on your themes, based on your, let me say, based on your interview guide, how it was designed. So you can write your questions and group your responses in those particular uh, questions. So codes, which are the labels that are given to sentence phrases, you group, you group your responses per every, uh, every question. For example, process of teenage pregnancy, what did they say for transcript one, two, three, four, and five? Uh, what, uh, what can be done to reduce teenage pregnancies? What was said? You also do the same for all the transcripts. So that is thematic analysis. Um, it, all, it, 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 it has a systematic approach. You familiarize yourself with the data through reading. You generate initial codes. Then you search for themes. You review the themes as you code. You keep on, uh, you, your, theme, your, your, your themes keep on changing. Remember, you might, you might find something which you do not uh, really uh, anticipate. You don't, that is data, you don't throw it away. You also code, so you'll have another, you'll generate another theme and rename it and keep on grouping your data. So you keep on defining and naming the, your themes as they, as they emerge. Then you can produce your report. Then you have the content analysis. Huh? It's, uh, this is more systematic and objective means of describing or, or quantifying a phenomena. So this method is usually used when you want to, to analyze documents, mostly uh, for document, and, document analysis. It allows you to test theoretical issues to enhance understanding of your data. So we have the inductive approach. We have two types of content analysis. We have the inductive approach and, did, and deductive approach. Inductive approach uh, uh, is derived from the data itself. So you're informed by your data as you read through. Deductive, on the other hand, is used when the structure of analysis is operationalized uh, based on, the, on your previous knowledge and purpose of the study. So for example, if my study, I just want to write a paper on, uh, on uh, implications of COVID-19 on COVID uh, on uh, teenage pregnancy, so just one specific paper. So my, my content, content analysis under deductive approach, I will narrow down my analysis, what I want in my paper. So I'm not going to get everything. But for the inductive, I'm going to capture everything as it is being informed uh, from the data that I have. They just have a slight difference, but uh, all of them are content analysis. Then we have discourse analysis. Uh, it is more of an analysis of the spoken and written language as it is used. Yeah? So you, you analyze how the language, the tonation, and the cultural perspective and identity. This is more anthropological. You try to give meanings uh, to how they, what they're saying, in what perspective, in what context, if there's cultural perspective and interference with what they're being said. You use a discourse analysis. So we have another analysis called the critical discourse analysis. And like other discourse analysis, uh, this one also, uh, it takes an explicit sociopolitical stance. This is more of um, into, if you are analyzing social a political data. They spell out their point of view, their perspectives, the principles, the aims, both within the discipline and within the society at large. So this is more specific. It gives a critical, it's like you're doing a critical analysis of, uh, of the opinions and the views. And then we have narratives. The narratives, are, as I mentioned earlier, they are stories. People share their stories and um, you, you come and uh, try to listen through those stories uh, and uh, give meaning to what people are saying from the stories. So the core, core objective is to formulate stories that are presented by people in different contexts based on their different experiences. So for example, if you're doing a patient experience in a hospital, you, every person will have a different patient experiences. So you'll have to look at the context in which these stories are being shared. And uh, so you analyze it based on the context, for example, this person was in a private hospital, I was in a public hospital, our patient experiences stories are going to be very quite different. So you're going to analyze uh, based on different contexts. So when you're analyzing your data for the observation as a method, remember I said you can also use observation uh, to really collect data. Look at the chronology of the events. How did the events happen? And uh, what was the setting of these events? Uh, 
uh, the place. For example, my, if it is in a hospital, maybe the, maybe the presence of uh, the senior doctors being around influence the nurses' behavior. So you're looking at the settings, you're looking at people that were involved in the events. If you're observing nurses, then they were doctors, and then we had non supporting staff. Was there an influence? So in uh, analyzing observation, you'll have to consider uh, those particular dynamics. So I'll, I'll jump the example and I'll just take you to, this is an example of a transcript. I know most people are asking what are a transcript. So in a transcript, we, we, we just type word for word of a particular audio. So remember the interviews were recorded, were audio recorded, you come and type. Most of the time people paraphrase. And when you paraphrase, you lose, uh, you lose the tonation, you lose the attitude, you lose the nonverbal cues. And as you can see here, you can see you have Bubble, bubble. The respondent is coughing. The respondent is laughing. He's talking aloud. So you, you when you read, you need to, you need to imagine. So you need to, to look at the, the, the conversation, how they are flowing. So this is an example of a transcript. So when you do your transcript. So for the softwares, uh, we have different softwares. Uh, I'm going to show you at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have different kinds of uh, and some people are suggesting that you could also type uh, you could copy paste maybe later in the chat their links so that they can be looking at these examples of the links. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So um, the um, the softwares that we have computer software. These softwares will help you to try some some softwares help to transcribe the data. Some will help you to edit the data able to try to edit inside the software you can edit your transcript some will help you to store your data some of the softwares uh, uh, help you to get the keywords or the the, the the mostly used words in the text some can help you to retrieve your data while others also help you to edit memos about the data so i'm saying some because not all softwares will give you these features so when you're choosing a software, you might be interested to know what you what do you want in a software. Do you want it just to for analyzing, for storing your data, for coding purposes only, or do you want it for transcription purposes also? So you need you'll be guided by what you want for to choose a software. So there's a type of type and amount of data that you want to do, the approach that you want to use. For example, if you are using grounded theory. We have uh, software which are very good. Uh, for example, Max QDA has a very good uh, found foundation for theoretical approach, unlike the other software. So you might look at what approach do you want to use. It might help you to inform which kind of software you might want to also uh, buy. Uh, the time to learn versus the time to analyze. Some softwares are very complicated. Do you have the time to learn? Do you have the time to, to learn and the time to analyze? The level of analysis that you want, do you want simple or detailed? And then also there is a, the individual or working as a team. Some softwares allow you to work as a team of 10 people on the same project in different setups, in different contexts. Some softwares will not allow you to do that. So those are the things you have to consider when you're choosing your software. And even the cost constraints, some softwares are very expensive. Others are free to, free to use, while others also you can get a trial versions that you can use. So these are examples. Atlas, Atlas is a paid for software. Uh, you have to buy uh, hyper search. Uh, you can use it for free. Max QDA also you have you you it has a trial version, but you, you have to pay for it. Then you have the ethnography, you have the in vivo, which is a common software. This is also you have to buy, but it has a trial version of two weeks that you can install and uh, try to use it. So these are just a sample of uh, we have very many that have come even online, but these are the common ones. That's it. Wow, what an insightful presentation. The chat box is on fire. People are asking for these materials. And a lot of people are so happy for your wonderful insights today. It has been just amazing. There is a number of questions, beginning with actually the brainstorming vignette, the case you gave us to think about. And Ahmed Abi says we can use questionnaire type to get the information, the information about whether 
our girl Rehema should be married into the family. Maybe you can comment on whether questionnaire is a qualitative tool. And then we also have a number of questions Charlie Kalinzi has asked. Where do we bring in actions and facial expressions that accompany statements? Is there a possibility of misinterpreting what one has observed and how do we handle this? Actually, I think in the chat box, uh, somebody actually responded to that, you know, about um, observation, that that is actually a method called observation. Um, I'll see who, who is that who responded. And then Vincent added to Charlie's question about Better still, can we compare nonverbal cues with the statements or sentiments of uh, people in qualitative analysis using IDIs or FGDs? So Vincent is asking about, uh, you know, the triangulation of uh, observation using an in-depth interview or a focus group discussion. And then he also asks, can we use facial expressions when scoring a Likert scale? such as satisfaction levels, etc. So just like the questionnaire, you'll tell us if like at scale is actually classified under qualitative. <laughs> and then uh, Chris Limo is asking, is there a need for pre-testing in qualitative research? If so, what would that need be? Okay, so I think we can take those three. Uh, the first one wasn't really a question, but Ahmed had suggested we use a questionnaire uh, in, in to get the right, uh, you know, husband for Rehema. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, th th thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. I think uh, up to now, Ahmed, uh, your thoughts should have changed. And I, I hope so. Yeah, so when you use a questionnaire, you remember, you need to get information about the particular family. Yes, you ask that person, do you know, do you know Juma? Yes. So what? So you so what? Yes, they know. Where does she come from? She comes from Kilifi. Uh-huh. So <laughs> how old is she? She's 28. He's 28. So you're not getting uh, any helpful information to help you make an uh, informed decision. You're only getting, um, I'll say more of a, uh, it's more of quantitative in nature, and it will just be yes, no, uh, age, uh, the place. So you, it doesn't give you the opportunity to narrow down into, into in-depth uh, information to understand who is this tumor. But if you're going to employ a uh, qualitative method, so for example, observations, you're going to use uh, interviews, and you're going to use uh, even um, documents, you're going to ask the, the people around, tell me more about Juma. Ah, Juma, that son of uh, so and so, ah, that boy, I've seen him for so many years. He's like this, like this. So you are giving the to explain in depth so that you get more, more information. The questionnaire or the survey is going to narrow you down. It's going, not going to give you any helpful information that you might need to answer or get a, make a wise decision. Um, right. Mm -hmm. Those, uh, and then Vincent another, asked, another, yeah, uh -huh. go ahead, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Just the last question, please. Yes, uh, so thank you. Vincent had asked about whether you can actually compare the nonverbal cues with uh, sentiments using IDIs or FGDs. I think that's a question about triangulation. Can you use IDIs or FGDs to triangulate the information coming from observation? And then he also says, can can you use a Likert scale for facial expressions like satisfaction levels, etc.? Um, mm -hmm. Can you use facial expressions when scoring a Likert scale? So you know, like the way people draw emojis. Um, yeah. Like when you go to the bank, you see Likert scales with emojis. So Vincent had asked that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vincent. I'll answer the first part. Uh, yes, you can use, uh, and uh, I think I had mentioned about, uh, it's advisable to, to use, uh, bo to use uh, the three methods, but to use a focus group discussion, to use an uh, interview, and to use observation together as one, one, as a one, as one approach of, of answering your research question. So your, one of the research questions can be answered using observation and still use interview and focus group to back up or to triangulate. For example, uh, I might say, uh, I'll use the example of the oncology nurses. You are looking at the, 
patients and instruction on the service they offer them. Then you go and they, they're saying, or the, the patients are saying, the nurses don't take care of us. They don't even speak to us. They just come to inject us. But the nurse, that is, but in your observation, you saw the nurse engaging with this patient, talking to her slowly. They were smiling. So you're able to, to, interro to interrogate uh, further, like, okay, I, I, I really get your point, but uh, I was here on this particular day and I saw the nurse talking to you, what are you sharing about, you know? So it gives you the opportunity to, to, to look at what you are seeing, the service uh, help get an opportunity to ask questions to, to help you answer your curiosity and what you are also observing. So it's wonderful. It's to use both. Actually, and, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead about the Likert skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, we can't use uh, we can't use the uh, uh, what I say uh, the emojis or the, the or any nonverbal cues uh, in the Likert scale. Remember, we qualitative uh, data is recorded, so we record the voice. Huh? We might uh, we, we we usually document the nonverbal cues. For example, if you are interviewing someone, this person was so frowning throughout the interview. That's why at the end of the interview, you sit down and you do a summary like, hey, this person, he was either he had his own problem or he did not like this interview. And how does this impact on the kind of response that this person gave you? So it's, it's not helping you like to really to, to use it in the liquor scale, but it helps you, those nonverbal cues will just be helpful for you when it comes to interpretation of your data. Wonderful. Chris Limo asked about, is there a need for pre-testing in qualitative research? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. There is a mixed reaction on that. Uh, some, some very uh, renowned qualitative researchers think uh, we don't have to test because uh, qualitative research in itself gives us the opportunity to change questions while in the field. Remember, once you go, once you you start interviewing a participant, you are participant one, you are the first day of the interview, come in the evening and sit down and ask yourself, how did the interview go? How were the question responded to? Uh, what question can I change that is not uh, being handled well? Is there a question that I can add? So we believe that qualitative uh, in itself gives you a room to add, remove questions because it's participant guided. Yes, but again, there is also value in pre-testing if you're not confident enough with your interview guide. Wonderful. Hilary Koros actually agrees with you and uh, is responding to a cause and says, yes, it's important to do triangulation. It's applicable, especially because when using observation. So thanks for that, Hilary. And then we have Leyan Mpayo. Leyan asks, and if we, what measures do we deploy to make sure interviewer bias is eliminated or avoided to negligible levels? So how do we remove interviewer bias? Question from Leanne. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> there are many more questions coming in. I'm trying to yeah, that, 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 That's nice. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that uh, people have been really following. Yeah, so, I might, I, I might say there is more bias in um, in analysis rather than in interviewing. I might say so because in analysis, my analysis is uh, is really based on my positionality and the subjectivity and, and my prior understanding knowledge of the subject and uh, how how I, I I as a researcher am interpreting the data. But when it comes to data collection, uh, we 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 have a very few uh, issues with the uh, with the interviewer biasness because. Uh, we, we try to hire people who are not uh, familiar with the respondent. And that's why you can see, uh, you, you get people who are not from that community. I'll say in qualitative, we usually try to get people who are not familiar with the participants first to encourage that, to encourage the participant to open up. Because uh, I can't open up to you if you are my neighbor. I'll not. If you're asking me about my household, if I ate yesterday, how many times, if, if my family, if there's anyone who has had a miscarriage or an abortion, I'll not tell you because it's a family affair. But if there's someone coming from outside and um, is a is a, an independent researcher, and then the participants are usually very free. Also, we assure them about issues of confidentiality, confidentiality about their 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 
opinion not being shared uh, outside the research team. So it's about uh, ethical issues uh, and uh, assuring them of confidentiality, privacy, the identification of the data. We are to assure them that their names not going to be used anywhere. And for sure, we de-identify their data using ID numbers. So that is what encourages the participants to participate and, there is the, and reduces the biasness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see many more chats. Charlie Kalinzi is saying, how easy or difficult is it to generate a theory from qualitative data in terms of time, cost, volume of data, and the demands of PhD students would you recommend a PhD student to venture into undertaking qualitative study with a view of generating a theory? Thank you, thank you. Uh, first, I'll say it will depend on what do you want to respond to answer. What is your research question? I think all, whatever approach we, we choose in research is determined by what is our objective, what do you want to answer? So if your question can only be answered in a qualitative way, for example, using the vignet, which I used in the, in the beginning of the, of the presentation, if your question needs in-depth uh, interview or opinion or discussions, then you have no choice but to use a qualitative because that is the only approach that can give you in detail and in-depth uh, information regarding particular research uh, topic. Yes, uh, right. I'll say uh, qualitative research is a bit expensive. Uh, if you're a PhD student, I, if you have funding, yes, it's workable. But again, if you don't have funding, there's always room for learning. I think uh, as a PhD student, you are learning how to do things. Yes, it's quite expensive in terms of uh, uh, time. It's very time consuming because you have to collect, record your audio. You have to buy a recorder or uh, a very, we call it encrypted recorder, record your work transcribe your transcript into transcript, you have to code the transcript, and then now you have to do the analysis. Yeah, so all those processes will be very time consuming and they'll involve money. And also you'll have to train qualitative uh, research assistants to help you if you're not doing the interview yourself. So yes, it's a bit quite costly. If there is funding, well and good. Again, if there's no funding or still, you have the enough time. It depends again with your timeline. If you have enough timeline, then again, it's workable, you can do it. And yes, if you also want to generate a theory, qualitative uh, research, the grounded theory approach is a, a very good method that will allow you to generate a, a theory uh, as a PhD student, which is, I think, is the ultimate goal. You need to generate knowledge and theories. Wonderful. Adewo Yin from Department of Crop Science and Horticulture asks, what analytical tools can be used to analyze quality of tomato and shelf life? I'm not sure if this is a qualitative type question. Maybe you will tell us, um, Paris uh, Adewoyin from Nigeria is asking about how to analyze quality of tomato and shelf life. And then we have a lot of people saying, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Paris. Wow, this is good knowledge, insightful and informative presentation. And uh, a lot of people saying thanks for that. Um, and some people asking for the links to the software. So if you're able to, otherwise it will be actually in the slides. So everyone who is asking for those links, you will get it. So aside from that question, um, we also have Zainab Shalangwa asking, is it compulsory to use interview quotes while presenting findings in report writing? Wow. So maybe we can take those two. I see Thank many you. more. I don't know. We'll try to reach as many questions as we can. <laughs> yeah, thank yeah. you. I'll start with the, the one for Nigeria, the quality of tomato. Yeah, so I'll, um, I, I think that's, uh, more uh, quality of tomato is I think it involves even lab test is more scientific you might need to have a uh, few different methods you might need to have this uh, the experimental scientific method uh, using the quantitative approaches and again you might want to to talk to people qualitatively you can only respond that qualitatively in terms of talking to the people or the community or the farmers who plant the tomato on the quality of the tomatoes. So maybe that's the only way you can uh, use the qualitative approach to understand the views, the opinions of what, what do people consider about the quality of tomatoes. 
So you'll have to, you can, you can incorporate qualitative into the other experimental and uh, analy analytical methods of quantitative research. And also next about to using the quotes. Uh, yes, it's mm -hmm. not uh, compulsory, I'll say, but uh, again, remember, you need to, to, when you are reporting qualitative research, you are raising the voice of the participants. Remember, it's not your uh, voice. So you, most of the time we use our qualitative quotes uh, to, uh, to bring into context what you are reporting and how, what the participants say. So it's the only evidence like, okay, this is not my words. This is the community that is saying this. So you might uh, use one or I know using too much quotations again becomes uh, too much because you'll be more of uh, your work will be more of quotation rather than report rather than the finding. So we encourage uh, narrowing down to two at most or one quotation for every finding that you report to make it uh, into context of what you are saying. Wonderful. Thomas Kogo says, what a wonderful session. We really appreciate. If possible, comment briefly on discussion of results from mixed method approach. And I think this uh, second one will be the last question. Mwanzana Masi says, do we have to use software in qualitative analysis? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I started the last one. Uh, okay. it, it, it's not a must to use a, a, a software in qualitative analysis and, and process. We can still use a manual way. There's a manual way of uh, analyzing your data. But remember, there I say manual. If you have 10 transcripts, you'll have to print, print all of them, print all of them, put on a table, group, uh, cut, every, cut every response on every question, cut them and put them in, in a specific uh, corner and start reading. If you have a, a blackboard, you can pin on a board, uh, team number one, team number two, team number three. So ideally what you can see is it's taking, it will take you ages to do all that work. Or you can, you can decide to highlight, highlight pages. But ideally the manual way will take you so, so long to really uh, complete the analysis. So there's a manual way if you don't have a software. But then again, there is a, the software has come to ease our life. It groups for you. It doesn't, it doesn't really help you that it's going to analyze for you, actually. Let me tell you the truth about qualitative work. You'll have to read those 10 transcripts, those 100 pages. You'll have to read all of them because you have to read for you to code. So it only helps you to group your data into specific groups. So when you open group number one, theme number one, you're able to see transcript, one transcript, what they said on that particular question. So it groups your work for you. But if you don't have a software yet, yeah, there's a way you can work out uh, manually. Wonderful. Then another one was about uh, uh, reporting a uh, mixed, uh, mixed, yes. uh, mixed method uh, research. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So when you, you're going to combine your, uh, most people use a, quali a mixed method that is quali qualitative, quantitative as a, a major method and uh, qualitative as a minor method. I've been seeing these are uh, frequently. So yes, a quantitative uh, might be your, your key method, but you're using a qualitative approach to back up or to triangulate your findings of the quantitative data. So when you're reporting and you're saying, I'll say 70% um, of um, teenage pregnancies in, 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 um, in Kisumu were caused by COVID-19. So yes, that is 70%. Then what were the reasons? So down there, I'll say, uh, However, we talk to the participants to understand in detail some of the reasons. So now you bring in the qualitative. So you can you can present both the quantitative and the qualitative work in a, in the same uh, in the same finding reporting. So the qualitative will help you to explain what the, the figures, the tables, the charts that you are showing in your quantitative presentations. It gives value and in-depth uh, explanations. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Paris. I see so many chats saying thank you, thank you. You organized. Uh, please keep it up and give us more about that analysis. So there's a big request coming through, and I was wondering if it's possible for me to um, 
request you if you can have a demonstration session as part two so that you can actually take a step by step with the thematic and content analysis um, maybe using um, the software or even just the the transcript that you are explaining to us Paris I don't know if you are uh, okay to uh, people want more they are so happy with this presentation so are you able to maybe next time show us how to do the analysis practically yeah yeah so <laughs> it's possible it's possible that uh, people have to have to it involves a lot of logistics as i mentioned yes. earlier you have to have okay. the software because mm -hmm. uh, it is like an application a phone application if i take you through unless you're going to write down uh, every yes. step and then now go and learn on your own because if i have to check you through you need to have the software installed then i'll yes. be taking you through everything so it is possible with uh, good preparation good planning Yes, it's possible. Oh, think thank about you it so much. Later. Yes, let's plan the logistics. We really appreciate your time and your graciousness to even go beyond the hour. As you can see, we had a very lively audience and thank you everyone for coming in today. Uh, if you would like, you can switch on your yeah. videos for a gallery screenshot and um, our knowledge management lead, uh, David, will do that. Thank you also to Aurelia the founder of Journal Club for her wonderful leadership. Thank you to Raymond, who is our programs coordinator. Our team at Journal Club are doing a very wonderful job. And recently we also got ourselves a YouTube channel where we post all the videos. The YouTube channel has been there, but we've recently now posted our videos. So please feel free uh, to subscribe and uh, watch all the past recordings. I can see people's videos are still coming on. So um, I think at this time, uh, David, you can take a gallery screenshot. This was very wonderful. Thank you, everyone. And we can still see many more thank yous coming in through the chat. So we appreciate you, Paris, and uh, we look forward to more. So uh, David, have you taken uh, the gallery screen? Yeah, yeah, I'm still taking, I'm still taking. Keep turning on your videos. Thank you. So this was wonderful. I see many people saying thank you so much, Paris. We appreciate. Asante Sana from Peter Mokaya. Okay. So David, let us know when you're done. We're still yeah, smiling. I'm done, I'm done. Now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, All right. uh, I, I, I hope I shared my email. Uh, oh, please do. Question. Yes, please. I shared on, on the first slide. So if you have a question, you can write to me. Mm -hmm. Or you can write to Angari and she can forward the question. Yeah, thank you so much for the good work from Adewoyin. There's many more thank yous. And thank you for sharing your email, perismusitia at gmail.com. All right. Have a good evening, everyone. Goodbye. Good evening, Wagari. Bye. Good thank, you. You. thank you. Uh, okay, I'll end the session now. Bye. Bye. Hi, and bye. bye. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye. All right.